Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. You know, Joseph, in the, in the Christmas story, we don't hear much about him. In fact, in Scripture, you don't have anywhere but one place where Joseph is listed as having said something. And did you know the one thing in Scripture that Joseph is listed as having said yes, was dear. the name <laughs> yes dear <laughs> i can always count on guys like dave rush and brother leroy to bring a serious moment and just, <laughs> I'm just I'm messing with one place and if you look in your scripture it says and he called his name and then the way that it's listed and the way that the grammar is, is listed in there, it, it means he actually said it, Jesus. Jesus. And if there was only one place listed of anything that I would have ever said in my life, wouldn't it have been a wonderful thing to have it listed that you mentioned the name Jesus? What a beautiful and a wonderful name. Brother Mark. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Victory Bible Class. Thank you all for being here today. We'll look at a verse of the day from John chapter 9. And in the meantime, let me give you the prayer request, the updates to our prayer list. We only have one. And let's make sure we get it right here. All right, we have Drake Cannon, who is a three-year-old, uh, unexplained ear pain. Drake had ear surgery back in the summer, I believe. Is that right? I believe, yes. Yes, and had uh, tubes put in or something like that, yeah. So he's still having, still having some issues with, with his ears. And this is Ruth's uh, grandson, a member of our class. Also, there's, over the last few weeks, there's been a, a lot of uh, loss in our church family. Don't forget the, the families of those associated with those whom, whom we have lost. It's just happened, it just, just has happened that way. We just had several, like right at one time. So don't, don't forget those families. I, I know life, life moves on. It, it, it flows on. And, and, and I get that. We, we all get it. But there, there are people who are still hurting. So let's, <laughs> let's not forget them. Um, Mr. Dan, next week we're having breakfast in here. Is that right? The annual yeah. The annual VBC breakfast. That means everybody I'm kind of looking at here needs to bring something here to eat, right? And yeah, okay. So yeah, except for us. All right. So you guys got that, uh, and and you will send out a reminder this this week, and we'll undoubtedly have some tables and stuff set up back here somewhere, and you can drop your your things off and eat and fellowship, and we'll have a good time next week. Okay. All right. Um, I mean lasagna. We'll take it. We'll take it. All right, let's do birthdays and anniversaries right quick. The only anniversary that I have is the Greens, which is today. Any other anniversaries? Anniversaries? Anyone? No? Nope. All right. Birthdays. Uh... These are December birthdays, so somewhere last week. Mark Larkey, I think I saw Mark back there somewhere. Yes, happy birthday. 
Davina King, Karen Smith, Seku Dorley, and Sandy Wade uh, coming up this week. Any birthdays that we missed? Any others? Any birthdays this week? Yes, I see a hand. I see a point. Uh, you're pointing to someone. Birthday this week, Angie? 13th. 13th. 13th, okay. Coming up in a week or two. Happy birthday. Anyone else? No one else? Last week? Tracy, last week. Thank you for your hand there, Tracy. <laughs> you got ratted out. Happy birthday last week. Marty, you're looking a little sheepish there. Um, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll look at uh, John chapter 9, and then we'll move on. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day that you gave us. You let us be a part of it. Thank you for the time we can be here together today. We want to pray for Drake with his, his ear problems, and that you'd be able to uh, get that solved for him, get that resolved, make it clear what the problem is, and uh, get, him, get him back on his way to health. We want to pray for those in our church family here who, <coughs> who have lost loved ones, and we just had so many recently. And we want to pray all the things that, that they're going to need to get through this time. This is a valley time, a time of a, a valley. And they need peace, comfort, compassion, love. They just need to know that you care about them and that you can get us through these valley times. We're all going to have them. And uh, thank you for the promises that you've put in your word. May we be in your word and in prayer every single day, daily, searching those out, letting them strengthen us and, and help us during this time of need. So thank you once again for our, our class and bless our church, those who are hurting, and draw us closer to you. I pray for Mr. Dan as he comes in just a few moments and, and uh, brings our lesson. Uh, God, his and his thoughts, that they may be what we need to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, uh, John chapter 9, in verse 5, last time we were together, we looked at something that said, Jesus said, I am the what? The light, yes, the light. So if we learn something about light, we learn something about Jesus. We're going to go back to my ink pen here. I, I, I should have brought a baseball, but uh, we're going to just use this and, and uh, learn something else about light. So, Let's start off this way. Let's pretend that I have a radar gun and I can point it at something and I can get its speed. Some of y'all are pretty familiar with radar guns, aren't you? <laughs> you? You have some familiarity with that. Well, let's pretend that all of you, every one of you, you have a radar gun as well. You can point it at my pen and you can measure its speed with your radar gun. All right, so you got it so far? I can measure it. You can measure it. Let's see what happens. I'm holding my pen right here, stationary. You measure it. You put your radar gun on it. How fast is it going? Zero in whatever unit you want to use. What if I put my gun on it? How fast is it going? Zero. So we agree? We agree. Let's say that I could throw this at exactly 50 miles per hour, just like, just like a baseball. I could throw it. And I've got a catcher over there against the wall. I could throw it at exactly 50 miles per hour. You have your radar gun on it. I throw it at exactly 50. What do you measure it as? What's its speed? 50. Sure. I have a radar gun myself. I, me I, me I throw it and I measure its speed. This is my radar gun. What speed will I measure it? 50. I mean, we agree, right? This is going 50 miles per hour. I can throw it at exactly 50 miles per hour. Now, let's change it just a bit. Let's, let's say that I am on a, a 50-foot trailer, tractor trailer, all right? So I've got somebody driving me down the road, except my trailer has, uh, let's say it's got plexiglass here so that you can see inside of it. It's not metal, or, or, or even better, let's do this. This is just a thought exercise. Forget wind resistance. Pretend that doesn't exist. I'm, I'm on an open trailer. All right, you can, you can see me. I'm holding my pen completely stationary. 
and I'm driving at exactly, or somebody's driving me at exactly 50 miles per hour. I'm holding it stationary. As it comes whizzing by you, you've got your radar gun, and you're measuring the pin. How fast do you measure it? 50. I've got my radar gun. I measure the pin. How fast do I measure it? Zero. Zero. Okay, now we, now we disagree. We agreed at first, but now we disagree. Okay, that's fine. Let's say that as my, tr my trailer goes whizzing by, I'm able to throw this pin at exactly 50 miles per hour, just like I did before. For forget air resistance. This is a thought exercise. I can throw exactly 50 miles per hour. You've got your radar gun. When this guy is going exactly 50 miles per hour and my trailer is going exactly 50 miles per hour, you click it, what are you going to measure the pin? 100, because I've given it a 50 mile per hour boost, right? When I measure it, I'm on the trailer moving at 50. I measure it when I throw it. What am I going to measure it at? 50, right? Okay, so, so far so good. That makes sense, right? My, my catcher over here, he's going he's gonna to catch it. It's going to hit his glove. He's going to feel it at what speed in, in both cases. 50, sure, because in the case when I'm moving, he's moving away from it as it approaches him. He's moving away at the same speed that it's approaching, so he's going to feel it at 50. All right, that, that makes sense. So, so speed... What is speed? Speed is distance over duration. Distance over duration, that's speed, okay? In this case, 50 miles per hour. That's the units we've chosen to use. All right, so far so good. Now, instead of, instead of uh, this being something that I can chuck at 50 miles per hour, this is going to be a laser. I can push the button and shine a, shine a beam of light. Because we're, 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 we're learning something about light. So I shine a beam of light, and I'm, I'm standing here stationary, and I go click, and I shine the beam of light. Now, a radar gun won't work here because light is way too fast. A radar gun is not precise enough to measure light. Let's just pretend that it can. This is a thought exercise. So here we go. Bam. You measure You measure the light, and you measure it at what speed? C. Well, use the letter C. C is the speed of light, okay? It's a very, 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 very big number. I've got my radar gun. Click, I measure it. How fast do I measure it? C, at C. We both agree, all right? Now, I'm going to go into motion again. I'm going at 50 miles per hour. I measure... I measure the light, but I'm traveling in motion at 50 miles per hour, but I measure it from here. What am I going to measure it at? C. C. Right. Because I'm moving at the same rate, just, just like if I was throwing it. U. I'm, move, I'm moving at 50. Click. The light starts. You measure light at what? C plus 50. Just, just like we did before, Right. Here's the insight that Einstein had that changed forever how we view the universe. When I'm moving at 50 and I start the light, you measure it at C, not C plus 50. No matter what we try to do, we cannot speed up light. We can't slow it down either. We can't be going this way and slow it down, shooting it out the other way. That means, ladies and gentlemen, if speed is distance over duration, distance is space, duration is what? Time. Space and time adjust in ways we don't understand to keep the speed of light constant. Now, if that doesn't bother you, what I just said, you, you weren't paying attention because that's a very bothersome statement. That I can speed up any object and measure it. It's, 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 uh, um, we can measure that and, and verify it empirically. I cannot change the speed of light. Light is the only constant in the universe. 
That's a troubling statement. If, if you really think this through, it's very troubling. See that I could measure the distance between here and that wall a million times and get the same answer, and it's never going to change. It, it does change. It changes to keep light constant. Light is the only constant in the universe. Now, Jesus said, I am light. Does anybody see where I'm going with this? I'm going to start two Bible verses. And I think you know these, and I'm going to let you guys finish them. So say them, say them out loud when, when I want you to finish it, okay? Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the past, today, the what? Present, and forever, the future. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus said, I am light. Jesus never what? Malachi 3, 5. Behold, I'm the Lord, I... Two words. Change not. Behold, I'm the Lord, I change not. Only one thing constant in this universe. Even space, and as weird as it is, time itself, as we think are constant, they are not. There's only one thing constant, light. Jesus in verse 5 said, I am what? The light. I hope that gives you some peace in your soul. When you're anchoring to Jesus, if, if you read something that he said in his word 2,000 years ago, it was true then, what does that mean if he doesn't change? It's true today. What about 100 years from now? Still true. Are you in his word daily looking for those things that are unchanging, that you can anchor your soul to, the things that can get you through these valleys that were true when they were written they're true now. They're true today. They'll be true 100 years from now. No, no changing. We change, don't we? In fact, Mr. Dan and I are getting ready to change places because you're up. Wow, I'm supposed to follow that up. All, I, all we lacked was a mic drop right there. Is that not? Man, that'll make an independent fundamental Baptist want to shout. I'm telling you. Why did everybody get all sad on me on that? That is epic. That is epic. That's just yet another thing that solidifies in my heart and in my mind that what we have is real. It is real. And it's indisputable, undeniable. And uh, you say, well, science says, yeah, science just said. Hallelujah. 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 Brother Leroy, the, a little bit ago you said something about uh, you make a mean lasagna. I need to correct that statement. You mean Stover's makes a, 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 a mean lasagna. We know the real truth. We know the real truth. <laughs> All right. Today, with the Lord's help, we are going to finish something. And I'm, I'm sad in a way, but happy in a way. But we're going to finish up our study on the Holy Spirit. Take your Bibles to the Ephesians chapter 5. Thank you, Brother Mark. Hallelujah. It's going to take me a, a, a second to get over that. That was amazing. I love it. Ephesians chapter... Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 first. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. Ephesians 5, 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife. And you can breathe, I'm going past that. <laughs> Even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. The last part of our study, we're going to look at the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the church. Now, the church, according to Scripture, is not a building. I need to clarify that. He said in His Word that we are... Now, we call this a church, but it's called many things. Some folks will call the place where we meet for services, they'll call it a sanctuary. You've heard that mentioned. 
You've heard it called an auditorium. You've heard the actual physical structure called a church. In fact, on our sign, we have Buffalo Ridge Baptist, what? Church. Because that's, that's a term that we've given it as a place where we meet. But in Scripture, the word church it is literally talking about you and I that make up the body of Christ. So any individual that has Christ in their heart, and I said any individual that has Christ in their heart, they've taken their faith and their trust and they've placed it on Christ. The thief on the cross, he was one. Abraham, he was another. Moses, another. Noah, these are greats that we know of. But even the not so greats, no matter what stripe, and I know for some of us, it pains us to even admit it. But we're going to be amazed when we get to heaven at who's there. And we're also going to be amazed at who's not there. Okay? But I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to be mean or ugly and all this, but I do need to clarify this. The church is the body of Christ. He said we are the church. He died for the church. He didn't die for a building. He died for souls. And that is you and I that make up the body of Christ. So, the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to the church, you have here in Ephesians 5.23, we know that Christ is the head. He's been referred to as the head. He's also been referred to as the groom. He's also been referred to as the Savior and the foundation. He's the cornerstone upon this rock, upon this cornerstone, upon this main basis for where we get everything, the foundation of the church. It says in Ephesians here, chapter 2, and verse 19, Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief, what? Cornerstone, in whom... All the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple unto the Lord. What's growing? The building? No. The body of Christ, the church, it's growing unto, and then he uses the term holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together, check this out, for an habitation of God. That's where God dwells. He doesn't dwell in... Now, where two, that's where you have the scripture where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them. But if you come in here after hours, God may or may not be dwelling in this room. He is right now. How do I know that? Because I think it would be safe for me to say there's at least two, maybe three that profess Christ as their Savior in this room. It's a wonderful thing. Together for an habitation of God through the what? Through the Spirit. Man, He's everywhere. He's involved in everything. Christ is the head. He's the groom, the Savior, and the foundation, the cornerstone of the church. The Holy Spirit is the craftsman, the Bible says, who formed the first church in the true membership of all true churches ever since. As we just read in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, placing each living stone into the church. Let's look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter is right towards the end of your, of your, of your Bible there. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse... Verse 3 says, if, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom 
coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Also, so you have the Holy Spirit as a craftsman who formed the church and placing each living stone into the church. It is thus the Holy Spirit then who adds unto the church. Go with me, and I'm, tr and I'm trying to be um, uh, cautious and, and slow enough so that we're not speeding through this. But Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. We have an example here of what he does. Acts 2.47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the what? To the church daily, such as should be saved. Many have been added to the church roles on earth. When I say church roles on earth, many have been added who have not been added to that holy role up yonder. Did we not see in Matthew 7 where Christ said, Many will say unto me in that day, In your name we did this. In your name we did that. So there are some in physical churches who would profess but do not possess. And just in case, I would be remiss as a minister of the gospel if I didn't take a moment to say, I would, I would make a plea to anyone under the sound of my voice. It doesn't matter how long you've been to church. Embarrassment is not worth spending an eternity in hell over. It's just not. In fact, I think you'll find that if you were, let's say you've had doubts, let's say that perhaps in your past, let's say that you never clearly understood how to be saved. You just, you were born into a, a good Christian family or a good moral family and you just always gone to church all your life. And that's a wonderful thing. Those are beautiful things. They're not bad things. But let's say that that's the case. But you yourself personally before God Whenever somebody touches on that subject, there, there's something in you that bothers you. You have doubts. Don't hesitate. Do not hesitate. Speak to someone. I guarantee you. I, could, I, could, I mean, I'd put money down on it. I'm not a gambling man. But in this case, I'd put money down on it. Every saved person in this room would wrap their arms around you and be so happy and would congratulate you and just be thrilled to death if you decided to go ahead and get that settled. It must be done. Do not wait. If anything life has taught us, you never know what tomorrow will bring. You just never know. So you have many that, that, that are on a church role, a physical human church role, that are not on a, and they're not on the roll in heaven. They're, 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 their name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. And that, that's what it's going to come down to. There's coming a day, according to the scripture, where God will say to an angel, is his name, is her name written in the Lamb's book of life? If your name is written, and boy, there's, there's something, another exciting thing. Um, I won't get into it now. But um, someday I'm going to share, you, uh, share with you something about uh, what I believe, based on Scripture, um, the Lamb's Book of Life started out as. Okay? How many, well, I'll just go ahead and give you a little hint. How many have heard before the phrase in Scripture about in a name being blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life? It, could it be, I'm just throwing this out there for consideration, could it be 
that we all started out with our name written in there. And those that rejected, their name was removed instead of the opposite. Very interesting. I'm not trying to start something here. But anyway. <laughs> Back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians chapter 2. It is the Holy Spirit who unifies the local body of believers, the local church, into one body. Ephesians 2, verse 11 says, Wherefore, Ephesians 2, 11, Wherefore, remember that ye been in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Here he's speaking to, he's speaking, he's speaking Jew, if you would. So he's speaking to a group that, that, that are very familiar with the statements that he's making. Because some of them, some of them that he's referring to, they believed that they were, and, and of course, the nation of Israel was declared by God as a, a special people. Okay? That, that, is, that doesn't change anything, but that has nothing to do with salvation. Paul himself said in Romans, there's a statement that he made, and he was serious when he made it. He was willing, he said that he would even go to hell and take their place if all of Israel got saved. That's how passionate he was about Jews being saved in this time. But he says, "...in strangers from the covenants of promise," so he's referring to that promise, "...having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ," he says. You're made nigh by the blood. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we have access by what? By one spirit unto the Father. So the spirit is unifying in the local church. The Holy Spirit then and the practice of the church. If we seek Holy Spirit power individually, and we've talked about that. We've talked about permanently possessing the indwelling of the Spirit in every believer. We've talked about that. But then also, the Spirit can be present corporately. So when we have individuals who possess the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God, then we can also sense a unifying Holy Spirit corporately. That's when you get, some have referred to, holy goose pimples. You know, when you're in service or a song is being sung and, and you just get blessed all over, um, you can sense the presence of the Spirit. Now, is the Spirit present, permanently indwelling every believer? Yes. But at times, there's a special presence that we sense or that we feel corporately. And that is something that every pastor that loves God and loves God's Word and walks with God, we yearn for, we pray for. Every Saturday morning, just down the hallway in the blue room, a bunch of guys meet and we pray every Saturday morning for Holy Spirit power and presence. And these statements are made. We can get up and we can deliver a beautiful message 
Not that we do, I'm just saying we could. There, that is a possibility. We could do that. And, and, and then on, I'm not speaking, I'm just saying we could, we could teach and we, we pray for Holy Spirit's presence in every classroom, on every, in every, on every podium that's being, the Word of God is being delivered. We pray for Holy Spirit's power and protection on every bus route. We pray that every Saturday. Why? We realize that if anything is done in a spiritual realm, you, listen, there are other places you could be. You could be in your recliner with a steaming hot cup of coffee. Rather than be here, we realize that, I realize that, we don't want it to be in vain that you have gathered together. And when we gather together, you and I both, we need Holy Spirit presence amongst us. We need life-changing truth to be delivered to our hearts, to be exposed by the Holy Spirit in each and every heart. Every individual has different needs. Not everyone has the same need. And there's no way one person can know all these needs. And there's no time to address every subject matter that would cover every person in this room. So the Holy Spirit then gets to work. And we want His presence amongst us. Every service, every class, every song, Everything that's done, it needs to be in His power. We seek His power individually. We seek it corporately. Then the Holy Spirit stands ready to revive the local church. The Holy Spirit is God. He's the third part of the triune God. He's that part that works amongst us. And God is alive. God is not dead Church shouldn't be dead. It should not be. You should feel something different when you're gathered together around God's Word. There's some things in Scripture that should bother us because the Scripture is alive and powerful. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it literally goes into the deepest part of our being and it discerns, it breaks apart the defenses, and it ought to be that way. The Spirit will convict and will warn us of our need for repentance and revival. And there's a slew of scripture that we can look at. This Spirit will also empower the worship of each local church. He longs to direct our hearts. Listen, I, I need practice. We will practice because anything done for God is worth doing right. But when you take away all the practices, we are mere human beings. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how beautiful your voice is. When, it, when you strip all that away, we are mere human beings and nothing can be done on a spiritual realm when it comes to music if the Holy Spirit is not present. I'll take a bad, off-key song with a Holy Spirit-filled heart any day of the week and twice on Sunday before I'll take somebody that gets up and just flawless in their delivery, dead as a doornail because their heart is not in tune with the Holy Spirit of God. There, I said it. And I mean it. And that goes number one for Dan Rogers. Every time I get up to sing a song, you say, well, singing comes easy for you. Yeah, that could be a danger. Because it's so easy to get into the flesh and just deliver something by flesh. Here in just a few moments when we step over into the auditorium, we must be spirit-filled when we lead folks in corporate worship because we're dealing with Almighty God. Dealing with the hearts of men. That's a grave responsibility. Very important. So the Holy Spirit is involved in that in worship, in praise, in prayers, 
and the exercises of the ordinances of baptism. That's a, that's a highly spiritual and a highly Holy Spirit thing. The Lord's Supper, very, very serious in service, in giving. The Holy Spirit is involved in all this. He'll give guidance and leadership and wisdom and unity to the church concerning vision, according to Acts 15. The Spirit will call. He will lead. He will empower pastors, Acts 20, 28, and 1 Corinthians 2. The Spirit will call, lead, empower, and send our missionaries, Acts 8, 28, and 13, 2, and 16. The Spirit will also empower us to fulfill Fill the Great Commission through soul winning and teaching and discipleship, Acts 1 8 and, 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 and Revelation 22 and Matthew 28. We cannot do the work of the body of Christ without the Spirit's involvement. On an individual basis, yes, that's where it starts. But then it carries over and it spills into corporate worship and service and activity. We want to be a Holy Spirit church. You said, Brother Dan, you going charismatic on me? I am not. But if that's what it means to you, then yes, I am. I'm all about the Holy Spirit. I need Him. I need Him. Well, that concludes our study on the Holy Spirit. And that by no means was an exhaustive study. There's, there's so much more that we can, Carmen and I were talking this morning and she was bringing out, you know, have you ever studied the first fruits in the Bible? Well, the Holy Spirit is actually the first, the first fruits of things to come. The Holy Spirit, everything that we've been studying about, that's just a taste of what God has for us. It's like that, what you brought out this morning about light. And He is the light of the world, the never-changing light. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for the privilege that we've had to learn a little more about you. Father, I pray that you would help us be a church in tune and sensitive to the leadership of your precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. See you in just a few. Thank you.